Welcome to episode 41 in our series on the surnames of Appalachia and the American South. Each of the family names we will cover today was requested by members of our YouTube community. You might note that I normally discuss surnames in the order that I receive them, but I rearranged today's list to get similar names placed near to each other. I think that will help you compare them. I'm posting an email address to the vantage point in the description so you can request a surname catalog if you want one. It contains 444 surnames and which of the 41 episodes they appear in. Please make surname requests in the comments section. That will help other viewers to see what might be coming up soon. Let's get this surname party going. Number 1. Hammett A few days ago I received an email from a fellow in England. He wanted to know if there are Anglo-Norman surnames in Appalachia. I told him that they're scattered everywhere across the South as well as Appalachia. Hammett is one of those Anglo-Norman names. The French ET suffix tells us that this ham is little. While Hammett is found across the American South, it didn't get around so much in the Isles. It's not found among the common surnames in Ireland, Scotland, or Wales. I'm confident that we can regard Hammett as an Anglo-Norman or English surname. Number 2. Fleener Folks, Fleener is a great example of why you can't always trust some online sources that claim to know the origin and meaning of our surnames. At least two online sources claim it's an Anglo-Saxon name, but none of my books on the surnames from the Isles mentions it. I believe that's because it's not from England. <laughs> Rather, it's an Americanized form of the German <laughs> you can find evidence for that contention in the Dictionary of American Family Names. Number 3. Grantham This is an English toponymic surname from Lincolnshire, England. George Fraser Black notes that the name is found in 13th century Scottish records, but he concedes that it likely came from Lincolnshire. It seems that Grantham folk, until they crossed the ocean, didn't stray too far from the eastern Midlands in England. It's not found among the common names in Ireland, Scotland, or Wales. I think that there's little doubt that Grantham is an English surname. But no doubt someone is about to write to say that his Grantham ancestor came from Scotland or Ireland. And that certainly is possible, but I'm talking about surnames that were common enough to be discussed in the books dedicated to that country's families. Number four, Fortner or Fertner. When I researched the surname Fortner, I couldn't help but be impressed by how much our English language is built on the structure of the German language, yet it's enriched with a vast French vocabulary. Aside from names, modern English only incorporated a little over a dozen Celtic words. In English, we're accustomed to seeing Ford used as a name or suffix to identify someone who lived near a river or stream crossing. Well, the Germans, the folks from whom we gained the structure of our language, also gave us words for all kinds of things. Fortner is derived from, which meant one who dwells near a crossing or gate. Fortner doesn't appear in any of my English, Irish, Scottish, or Welsh surname books. I'm confident that Fortner is an Americanized form of a German name. Number five, Carnes. About 10 miles from Knoxville, Tennessee, and my three granddaughters, uh, Zoe, Hattie, and Rosie, sits the charming little town of Carnes, Tennessee, population 3,500. I always thought that the town's name looked like corn, but Carn doesn't refer to the plant. As a geographer, I love toponymics or surnames based on a location or place or a landscape feature, but Carnes isn't a toponymic. In the case of Carnes, it's derived from Scottish Gaelic. If someone built a carn for you, it would be quite an honor. That's because it's a stone-built monument. While folks with the surname Carnes is found in England and Ireland in limited numbers, I'm confident that it's a Scottish surname. Number six, Pitt or Pitts. One of my favorite movies of all time is A River Runs Through It. It's about a Scottish and American family headed by a Montana preacher, his wife, and two teenage sons. Trout fishing is a source of bonding for the father and his boys. As we learn throughout the film, a river flows through their lives, hence the title of Norman McLean's book and the Robert Redford directed film. The story takes place between 1912 thereabouts and the early 1920s. The Montana setting looks a lot like the Scottish Highlands. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. The movie introduced me to a young actor named Brad Pitt. 
I was surprised to learn that Brad was raised in Springfield, Missouri, the Queen City of the Ozarks. It's no wonder he can do an Appalachian accent like he did in Inglorious Bastards really, really well. Anyway, as I've stated many times, the culture of the Ozarks is an extension of Central Appalachia. Both of my kids were born in the region, so I feel quite at home amongst its hills and farms. If you go there, you'll hear people say things like yuns and fixin' to. At any rate, Pitt was derived in England. Pitts, with a plural form, can be the son of Pitt, or it could be a reference to more than one Pitt family member. It was given to a person who lived near a pit, but I have no idea the purpose of the pit in medieval England, and I hope it was something cheerier than the snake pit that served as a means of death for the Viking king Ragnar. At the end of the day, the absence of pit among the common surnames of Ireland, Scotland, and Wales encourages me to call pit an English surname. Number seven, Mays. If you're a lifelong baseball fan and about my age or older, you've heard of Willie Mays. Willie was born in Westfield, Alabama. He had a professional baseball career that lasted 22 years. He's still alive at the age of 91. Way to go, Willie. Alas, Willie's surname wasn't created in Alabama or any other southern place, at least in the United States. May is an old English name for a man, warrior, or kinsman. Mays means the son of May. McIsaac says that this English surname has been in West Meath, Ireland since the medieval times. Black points out that May has been in Scotland since at least 1291. It doesn't appear to be among the more common names in Wales. McIsaac points out Mays is a linguistically English name, but only a paper trail could help clarify if your ancestors considered themselves to be Scottish, English, Irish, or even Manx. Number eight. Fortenberry. According to the Dictionary of American Family Names, Fortenberry is an alternate iteration of the Dutch surname Falkenberry. It's not found among the common names in the Isles, so I think we're safe in calling Fortenberry a Dutch surname. And 9 and 10, Berry. B-A-R-R-Y and B-A-R-R-I-E and B-E-R-R-Y. <laughs> wow. Now, Let's take away the Fortin and just look at Barry. As you might imagine, I have an interest in this name. For some reason, when I was a kid in the 1960s, a lot of older people would ask me if I was related to Barry Goldwater, a senator from Arizona who lost a bid for the presidency for the Republican Party in 1964. At the age of eight, that question made me think, are you daft? Barry's not my surname. It's my given name. Later, I found out that a lot of people have first or middle names that were relatives' last names. For example, my uh, uh, triple great-grandfather had a son named Dixon Van. Well, Dixon was uh, the name of his wife's maiden name. Oh, well. At any rate, according to Harrison, Barry is a French toponymic from the Pyrenees Mountains, but I'm not in agreement with Harrison on this one. He says that B-E-R-R-Y was used to identify a person who lived by a burg or hill. When I did some research on Barry, B-A-R-R-Y, France, I found that it's just a commune. And communes remind me of Jonestown, Guyana, or Charles Manson's hangout in the hills outside of Los Angeles. No thank you. I discovered that Barry is also a Scottish toponymic from a wee village in Angus. It can also be spelled with an I-E on the end of it. If you're not confused by now, I think that McClysick might just push you over the edge in discussing the Berry folks in Ireland. McClysick claims that B-E-R-R-Y and B-A-R-R-Y are found there, but they have different meanings and origins. The berry, like a fruit, B-E-R-R-Y, has been scattered around the Emerald Isle since the 1600s, and berry with an A, on the other hand, is derived from a good-sized Welsh town handily named Barry. It's in a beautiful vale of Glamorgan, the former seat of the Vans of Marcross, allegedly some of my ancestors. How about that for a coincidence? Well, folks, that's about all I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please like, share, and subscribe to The Vantage Point. If the man warrants it, I'll be back soon with episode 42 of our series on the surnames of Appalachia and the American South. Until then, I hope the good Lord smiles on you and yours. Bye-bye.